All right, thanks everybody for coming. Welcome to Defend Truth uh, and Abortion Now Seminar. We're really excited that you're here. It's good to see so many faces in the audience today. Uh, you're getting a special treat here with the live recording of the seminar. A little bit about us, uh, Defend Truth Ministries. We officially launched um, about four, five, six months ago um, out of a, a Chick-fil-A restaurant. So if you're concerned if we have the anointing of God, we were in the Chick-fil-A when we launched this. So um, my name is Nathan Croxid, co-founder of Defend Truth Ministries. We started this with uh, Nick Matei, who's sitting in the back there, co-founder as well. Um, Corbin, who's working the, the camera this morning, he's our director of communications media. Jess is upstairs. Uh, he's our amazing writer, uh, and he communicates everything that we do into a good newsletter. Uh, so we thank him for that. And then we got Joe, who started with us as well, and he's going to provide amazing resources for the uh, the Catholic outreaches and just information on that as well. And then Nolan, who couldn't be here with us today, um, he's just an amazing dude all the way around and kind of does the business side of things for us. Um, so. We partnered with End Abortion now for a specific reason, and you're going to find out why. Um, this is our abortion wing of the ministry here, um, our abortion ministry ring, if you will. We have three peers to this ministry. Um, it's ending abortions, reaching the cults, and staying gospel-centered. And so this is what you're seeing here is the end abortion now side of that. And then we also reach out to the cults. And when I mean cults, I'm talking about Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, anyone who claims to be Christian but deviates from those essential doctrines, um, they are in a Christian cult. So excited you're here. Um, let's get started with what end abortion now is, and it'll give you a little bit of background of how it started and why we partnered with them. EndAbortionNow.com was a website where we would have local churches governed by pastors coordinating together with a very focused, consistent message on the Word of God, on the Gospel, preaching the Gospel in the context of abortion. We launched EndAbortionNow.com and we sent off to so many churches, at this point I forget how many, we sent off to all these churches their own kits. We provided training and resources for free, no cost whatsoever to the church. And our plan was threefold. We knew we needed to do three things. One, we needed to mobilize Christian churches around the world, but specifically for us across the United States. We needed to equip them with the right message, the message of the gospel. So we knew it couldn't just be Apologia Church. It had to be local churches across the country. And in order to do that, we had to provide a platform that would actually communicate through media across the world. We knew it had to be, of course, us, but it also had to be other churches doing the same thing. So we needed to actually bring the message of the gospel, a consistent Christian approach and response to abortion in the area of abortion. We had to do it through media. And the third platform we knew that needed to take place was the legislature. All right, so you got a little bit about the background there. Um, it's specifically a global movement, okay, of Christian churches and ministries. So what you heard him say there is equipping churches, local pastors. Um, this and defend truth ministries. We're not a we're not a church, obviously. We're a we're a you know a association of brothers coming together with a specific goal in mind. But um, we're not pastors. Um, some of us are in seminary and working to become pastors. But they also had a unique opportunity. They said, hey, as long as you are involved in a local church of your own, uh, where you're under the authority of good godly elders and pastors, you can, as a ministry, um, get approved to partner with them. So like you saw there, we put in our application for that. They sent out the resources that we needed. Um, and it started just from a, um, just a, just a, I guess a seed sowed in my own heart that God had placed in my own um, heart to, to reach uh, these men and women at the abortion mill. And um, there was a specific sermon that I watched um, about this movement, about abortion, and it really lit that fire inside of me. Because I, I'd grown up pro-life, I grew up in the church, I knew that abortion was wrong, but I didn't know how to get involved. I didn't know what approach to take. You know, there's so many conflicting opinions on how to reach these men and women out there. And, and then I saw this and it, it completely changed uh, my outlook to what we were doing. Because this atheist was there in the providence of God, because I got to preach the gospel to him, because he was right in that spot, my friend Justin, who was with me, was so worn out, was so worn out 
that he decided to walk away and around the building to the front where he weren't at before, where you can see outside Planned Parenthood to look. And it just because this atheist was there, and just because he was wearing us out, Justin was in his head praying to God, I think, God, I'm done. This can't be effective. This is too crazy. It's too much conflict. This can't be good. So he gets a sign, and the sign says, please don't hurt your baby. We'll help you. And he goes to the front where the doors are, where you can see out. He stands there and he plants and he's praying, Lord, it's just worthless. It's, I'm not coming back. I can't do this. And just that moment, because the atheist was there in the providence of God, and Justin walks to the front with a sign that says, please don't hurt your baby. We'll help you. Inside Planned Parenthood was a man named Chris. And Chris was praying in his mind while his wife was in the back getting ready in pre-op. In the lobby, God, if you want me to do something, give me a sign. So he looks out, and he prays another prayer. He says, God, if you want me to stop this, let that man be the owner of dozens of cars. That van down the street opens the doors, walks straight up to Justin, who's there now. <laughs> he says, excuse me, are you the owner of that van? Justin the van down there? Chris says, yeah. He goes, yeah, that's my van. And the guy tells him the story. I asked God if that's your van, if I should stop this. And Justin goes, get in there and get your wife right now. You go in there and you get your wife. Chris runs in the back. He busts into Planned Parenthood. Gets his, he wants to get his wife out. They're like, no, you can't go back there. pre op you can't go back. He's like, you open that door right now. And finally, he was able to get through those doors and to get his wife. And they told me, don't go to abortion mills with the gospel. It's too abrasive. It's about the gospel. The problem there is not political. It's heart. And hearts don't change without the good news. You need to be willing to risk everything. And that's not the end of the story. Tina, would you come on up? Where are you at? This is the baby. Okay, powerful stuff, isn't it? That's a real life, real life living baby right there. Um, because of their message that they went down, they brought some signs. Uh, faithful men and women are holding these signs. They're coming down there, they're sharing the gospel. Um, and that happens a lot while we're down there. It happened to me the first time I went down there. I got this first kit that came in the mail. This was before we had started Defend Truth officially. Got this kit, was all fired up, got in my car, went down to the Planned Parenthood in St. Paul, and I sat there probably for in the parking lot of the adjacent building for an hour and a half, gripped in fear, trembling. Couldn't move, just paralyzed, because I said, the enemy was telling me, you can't do this. They're not gonna listen to you. Don't yell at these women. Don't take this message in there. You're going to get mocked in the street. You're going to look like a fool. You're going to end up on YouTube. And sat there. And then the Holy Spirit of God, he took me out of that fear and brought me into a holy boldness. And I walked up just with the sign that says, we'll adopt your baby. And took my little, uh, the little uh, microphone thing that they give you to amplify your voice because the women walking in, it is a little, it's a reach there. So you got to elevate your voice a little bit. And got there on the corner, it was just me, another sweet lady that was there. It was a Tuesday afternoon. And as I'm standing there, gripped in fear, here comes the first car that comes in. It's a woman. She parks the car. She gets out of her car. And to my shock, you see a bump. You see a baby bump. And this is the first woman that I had in contact with in this ministry. And just out of nowhere, all I started saying was, Ma'am, please don't murder your child. I'm here because I love you. You, you're a mother with a baby. Abortion is murder. Turn to Christ and live this morning. And, and we'll help you out. We'll adopt your child. We'll give you resources. We'll, our church will help you financially. She flipped me the bird. She said, F you. And that was that. And she walked in. And the lady next to me said, you know, I've never heard 
that message here. I've been doing this for 40 years. You came with, uh, that, was, that was different. I haven't heard that before. And it's nothing special with me. It's, it's the gospel that she heard. It's the gospel that is special. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And she said, now we need to pray that she comes out within the next hour, hour and a half. I said, why is that? And she said, if they come out an abortion will take roughly about two hours from beginning to end. And she said, if, if she comes out within that hour, hour and a half, you know that she didn't go through with it. We just know that. It's just, a, it's just because they don't deviate on the times and things like that, the process. And so just started praying. Um, and before you know it, a half hour later, she came out. And so she got back in her car. She drove up to me. And she just rolled down her window. You could tell she just was furious. But I said, Miss, I'm here because I love you. I'm in tears saying this to her. I said, please don't murder your child. I'll adopt your baby. And she said, you'll really adopt my baby? I said, I will adopt your baby. She's like, no Christian has ever. You guys shout. You guys preach. But you never come through with anything. That's her experience. She said she grew up in the church uh, full of hypocrisy of Christians that voted pro-life but never in the, you know, were probably, you know, doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. And so she just felt like, what, what can the church offer me? And I said, it's not about the church, miss. It's about the gospel and it's about, you know, Jesus and putting your faith in him and he'll change your heart from wanting to murder your child um, to wanting your child to live. And it's within those 10 minutes, you know, she just took the, she took our resources, she took the card. I said, just sleep on it. Don't make this decision. Call me if you need anything. Um, I haven't heard from her, but we pray that she has never gone through with it. That was the very first experience that I had. And as soon as she left, I stood there and was like, okay, all right, this is, um, you know, this is life and death. These are real babies. These are real women. And so, um, that, that, and it stemmed from that, and then that's why I was like, we need to get this going with Defend Truth. And before you know it, uh, other men with uh, the same conviction came alongside me. Uh, we had some other people come, and then before you know it, we have uh, you know, 20, 30 people outside of the abortion, uh, of Planned Parenthood with their signs, and, and it just took off like that. Um, it, the reach of end abortion now, particularly though, has took off as well. From a local church um, that you saw there with Pastor Jeff Durbin in Apologia Church in Tempe, Arizona, um, it started out of that little uh, Reformed Baptist church down there, and it has grown into over 400 churches now and ministries partnering with that church, sending um, materials out, and, and it's gone globally as well. It's spread to Canada, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. So this is a global movement. And it's a different abor abortion movement, particularly with uh, different languages and different messages that we send. It's a Christian approach. It's like you said, like he said, said there in that video, it's not a political approach. This is a Christian message that we're bringing, the gospel. It's a gospel issue, not a political issue. And so when we take that to the abortion mill with the gospel versus just political um, statements and pro-life statements and things like that, we, we give up the foundation, if we do that, of the Bible. And so we go there with the foundation of the Bible as their sole authority, and we don't give neutrality to uh, the pro-life people that are with us. And I want to be clear that we don't, we don't go there with a animosity to the pro-life movement. Uh, we, we understand that uh, you know, thousands of babies have been saved because of the faithful men and women in these pro-life groups that have faithfully shown up. But what we see, what I've seen since I was um, you know, old enough to understand what's going on is that I haven't seen abortion, nothing's really changed other than some legislation that has been passed, but abortion is still alive and well in this country. And no amount of legislation that they've passed has stopped abortion, and we want to end abortion in our country. That's why this, uh, the ministry is called End Abortion Now. It's not called Regulate Baby Murder Now. It's called End Abortion Now. And so that's one of the major differences. And what you're going to see from these next few slides are just the differences in approaches from the established bureaucratic, national pro-life uh, movements that are out there and, and to the message that we're bringing to the abortion mills. We saw that there was a moment in Oklahoma where they had an opportunity to criminalize abortion. And we had friends that were there, people that were there, and we heard that one of the people that was stopping a bill that would criminalize abortion in Oklahoma with a predominantly pro-life legislature, one of the people responsible for stopping it was Tony Lounger. He was the vice president of National Right to Life, one of the largest pro-life organizations on the planet, actually. So he was at the legislature that day, and we got a message through to him and asked him if he'd be on 
the program with us to talk about what was happening in Oklahoma. He agreed. And so we had him on the program, and I was talking to Tony Lowinger for a little while, and I wanted to let him tell his story. I wanted him to explain from the national pro-life movement perspective, what was their methodology? What was their foundation? And what you can hear in that interview, and it's available for the world to listen to, is Tony Lowinger, again, the vice president of one of the largest pro-life organizations on the planet, talking very candidly about the fact that they want to take a backdoor approach in the pro-life issue. It, they don't want to make it about Jesus and repentance and the gospel. You want to not use words like murder, those sorts of things. And so what you can hear in that interview is one of these leaders of the pro-life movement essentially saying this is not a Christian movement. It's not Christian. Because again, I'm, I'm fairly new to this fight. Um, I've only, I mean, I've, I've obviously been pro-life since I've been a believer. It's interesting for me to kind of understand how you guys operate and how you guys think we should go about doing this more effectively. Uh, so two questions I think would, people would want to know is number one, um, and it's, it's a tough one, and so I'd, I'd love to hear your, how you feel about this. Um, are women who have abortions murderers? We do not believe that a woman who has an abortion should be prosecuted. Well, that helps a lot, Tony. So we would say the abortionist is a, we would say that's murder. We want to have him prosecuted for murder, but the woman, not so much. We don't want to, we don't want to go that route. Right. We don't, oh. we don't believe that the woman should be prosecuted. Okay. So, okay. And I, you know, it's, it's a, maybe it's a fine point, but, but we would not say the abortionist ought to be prosecuted for murder. We would say the abortionist ought to be prosecuted for for killing the unborn child or for homicide. But murder is a murder is a technical term that depends on lots of circumstances. It was Tony Lowinger. That day is the day where I was interviewing him. You and you and Luke were like, "That's it." That was, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I was in here talking to Tony Lowinger, and we heard him saying, backdoor approach, like don't use God's word, and that's when you guys, we all said, we have to do it. Yeah, so you heard it right there from the horse's mouth. Um, you can, I know that's a, that's a, I understand that's a really, like a, it's a tough thing, you know, what, what should we do? Like what happens, you know, are women murders when they do this? Well, what's going on? What is happening? What's the difference between a, a woman with a, uh, you know, children in her van that drives it. She says God told her to, you know, drown her kids, so she takes them out to the river and they drive into the river and they drown all their kids. What and what is she called? Um, it's something that there needs to be a paradigm shift in the language here, um, as far as what's going on. And to the, even the fact where he said that the uh, the uh, the abortionist shouldn't even be prosecuted for murder. Well, what is happening when when a little baby's uh, arms and legs are ripped apart and put together back on a tray? That's just, what, that's just what happens to make sure that the, the woman doesn't get sick when she leaves there. What's, what, how is that diff, different than Auschwitz, than what the Jews did? Uh, what happened to the Jews by the Nazis? What's going on? Should we, should we then go say, hey, you know, Hitler, he, he wasn't a murderer. He wasn't a murderer. He just had a different worldview. Yeah, it's icky, but, you know, we can't call it murder. It's too abrasive. Right? So that's how we, when we say abortion is murder, we're, we're giving them the, the law of God that says that, that there's life in the womb, that God commands you not to murder your child, but then we give them the hope of the gospel. Because that's ultimately what's going to change uh, a woman or a man's decision of wanting to murder their child into wanting to let their child live is the gospel and the gospel alone. That's the only thing that will save. And then we offer them help and resources from that. It's not just a, hey, you know, preach the gospel and then, by the way, you're on your own. The church isn't going to help you out with anything. No, it's not about that. It's about we will help you with whatever you need. Just don't murder your child. So that's one of the biggest differences of why we partnered with End Abortion now. We believe it's the responsibility of the church to fight abortion as Christians who stand on the word of God. I heard a quote once that shocked me was that abortion is still legal because of the approval of the church. There should be a big sign on front of Planned Parenthood that says, open due to the approval of the church. What I mean by that is that a lot of times what we think in our comfy Christian uh, circles and churches now in America, in the West, is that as long as I just vote for pro-life candidates, I'm doing my duty. 
As long as I just fight to get another Supreme Court legislator on that Supreme Court, I'm doing my duty and that's going to change it. Well, we saw when in 1991, when they had, it was a majority Supreme Court of Republican Supreme Court justices that they could have ended abortion right there, struck down Roe v. Wade, and they still didn't do it. It was eight to one. Eight to one. Yeah. Eight to one. And they still didn't do it. And so we don't, are we going to put our faith and hope in flawed human beings? It's, it's, I get it. Like, it's okay. Um, it's good that we have pro-life candidates that are willing to do something in this fight. But to just put our hope and faith in, in this system is it, they're, they're flawed human beings like the rest of us. The only thing that can truly end abortion in this country is going to be the power of the gospel and changing hearts of these men and women. So we, I say this humbly that the pro-life movement has failed to end abortion because they've abandoned this sure foundation of the Bible. You saw in the, in the clip and you'll see in the next clip here that they don't want to call this a Christian Problem. This is just a human rights issue. So let's abandon the, the Christian worldview of calling it murder, calling it sin, putting your faith in Jesus. Let's take all that out and let's just make it some uh, coexisting movement of, of, I guess, humanistic thinking. Um, but the problem with that is there's no such thing as neutrality. Right? So where do you get the foundation to even call abortion wrong or abortion murder without, where do you go to that? What, what, is our sole authority? What is our foundation that says it's the word of God that specifically calls abortion murder, calls us to repentance of sin, and, and putting our faith in Christ, will we change our minds from doing that? And so that's one of the main reasons why we partnered with End Abortion Now. So why don't you start off by telling me kind of what's happened since babies are murdered here? So, okay, so all the way back to yeah, five start. years. After the movie happened, everything, just start there. The most shocking thing about the release of Babies Are Murdered here when we released it was the fact that the pro-life community wouldn't touch it. Uh, we released what we thought was an excellent documentary and we really couldn't get anybody to share it. And uh, it was a fight from the beginning to get it out there. Why do you think that is? Well, the pro-life movement didn't want it because we were talking about abortion being murder. <laughs> And we were calling it sin, and we were saying that it was the gospel of Jesus Christ that you need to bring to bear with the abortive mom. And the pro-life movement didn't want us to call it murder. They didn't want us to call it sin. And they told us that we shouldn't talk about religion when we're out in front of the clinics. We just didn't know any better, and we believed that the gospel could actually change people's lives. It turns out we were right. It's absolutely fine right there. Sure, I'm the director of American Victims of Abortion for the National Right to Life Committee, and that is one of our several outreach programs. It was developed in the early 1980s by women like myself who have been through an abortion experience alongside of sometimes the fathers of aborted children. And we are really uh, a public, uh, if you will, public witness to what we know about the experience of abortion from the inside. The pro-life movement has a lot of women who are active in it who've had abortions. And they very much argue that the mother who got the abortion is also a victim. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another example there. So what we're I want to make this clear. What we're saying is that if a woman has had an abortion, that doesn't disqualify her to come out and help us and to preach the gospel because newsflash, the blood of Jesus washed away those sins if she's in Christ. And and we don't we're not looking at former women who've had abortions as um, if they're in Jesus as, as current murderers that need to be punished. That's not the message there. The message is clear um, is that if we can't call it murder, we're never going to be able to, no amount of legislation 
is ever going to officially abolish abortion in this country. Because if you go to your legislator and just say, "Hey, um, I'm coming to you because I don't. I'm with some, you know, atheistic worldview faith movement, right? But we just don't like abortion because it's gross and icky." And and you and they're going to say, "Well, what makes it legally wrong?" Because that's what the, ju- the the judicial system is grounded by the law. So what makes it wrong? What are you, you know, what are you here to, you know, if you if you call it murder, well then it's murder. How do we prosecute murder? What ha- you know? Then you can say, well then yeah, it's murder. It's a life in the womb. So that's just the language that we're trying to use here. Of course we have compassion for the women that are going in there. Absolutely, this is not something um, that we're looking at women that have had abortion and just like completely setting them off to the side and saying, now you're disqualified. No, we all were depraved human beings in wretched sin and depravity until Jesus saved us, right? And so we're just taking it to, but what saved us out of that? It was God's grace through the gospel. It wasn't a system. It was only the gospel that brought us out into that. So that's, it's just looking in and exposing what's going on within this pro-life system of bureaucrats that are raising a lot of money, but you're not seeing a lot really being changed. And part of it is because of the messages like this. We don't generally address it from a religious perspective because in the same room at National Right to Life, one might have uh, a Christian, a Jew, an agnostic, an atheist, uh, a Catholic, you will have a variety of people because as a human rights issue, as the elemental human rights issue of all time, everyone should be engaged in this conversation. Everyone should be able to identify with a comprehension that these actions end innocent human lives. So as an argument towards justice, ultimate perfect justice, we have to stand focused on this argument from the scientific perspective because that is a unifier and that is has proven to be one of the reasons why uh, what we do at National Life Life is so successful because anybody from anywhere could say I get that I can comprehend that now let's talk about what comes next throughout the scriptures you can see that God has always brought about the greatest transformation to glorify himself through the smallest numbers. And the pro-life movement has had the mindset over the last 40 years that we need the largest numbers. We need this ecumenicalism. We need to sort of uh, approach this with neutrality. We need to minimize the Christian language, not be explicit, take a backdoor approach. Why? Because we need the largest amount of people to come alongside us together so let's change the narrative let's change the message let's not use explicitly christian terminology why because we need to be this huge army and there was actually an example in scripture where god tells somebody your army is too big god wants to glorify himself through the truth and he does it at times with only 11 very confused disciples There are also many who see this, not from a religious perspective, but simply a scientific perspective, and maybe even a moral conviction against killing innocent life. And so the pro-life movement is big. We welcome everyone who acknowledges this pre-born life as innocent and worthy of society's protection to join us. When pro-lifers try to approach this from any other foundation than the Word of God and Scripture, and how God calls us to fight this and even define our terms and our categories when we come to this issue, you end up excluding the exclusivity of the gospel, like from the way that you fight, because you have to satisfy and keep happy all of these different worldviews and and people that are involved in this, this fight in your effort in the pro-life movement's effort to bring all these different groups in to try to link arms with them and fight alongside them against this juggernaut of abortion, it ends up softening and weakening like the weapons of our warfare. So you went to make a movie and church would break out. Yeah, Yeah, well, (laughs) that's the funny thing. We had Catholics, evangelical, we had priests, pastors from all over the country, rabbis. I mean, it was an amazing thing. The one thing that everybody from every denomination understood, we even had atheists praying. I don't know how that works. But (laughs) uh, but is that this is an issue that crosses those lines. When the pro-life movement, by and large, like as as a collective unit in the sense of you know, even bringing into the fold um, secular 
pro-life groups that don't even believe in God, that don't have any basis for, for value or dignity or uh, of human life or worth or anything like that, when, you, when we bring these types of groups together, we're really just spinning our wheels. This fight only makes sense. It only has meaning if we have the Bible at our feet defining what a human being is, um, why it's wrong to take their life, why it's wrong to actually commit abortion, how does God define it, and what's the statute or precept or penalty that needs to be brought in in order to bring justice for when that violation of his law uh, happens, and then ultimately what the solution is. You can't have that when you're bringing all of these different groups together and just trying to have a seat at the table for each one of them. Theologically, the pro-life movement is, is comprised of Roman Catholics that, are, that differ from us on the gospel to begin with. And, um, you know, they just want us all to be at peace and they want big numbers to end it. And what it really takes isn't big numbers. What it really takes is people being faithful, local churches deciding that they're going to do something rather than just vote, rather than just go to a march for life. Uh, rather than give five bucks to a, a pro-life lobbyist. So what's our message at the abortion clinics when we go there? Uh, you saw the difference. Uh, we kind of explained kind of what makes End Abortion Now and why Defend Truth Ministries partnered with End Abortion Now to bring hope and, and love to these women at the abortion clinics. We have a clear four-part message that we say um, that we want to make it very clear. Every time we're down there and we come encounter with a, a woman or a, a father that's walking into the abortion clinic, number one, it's very simple. Abortion is murder. Abortion is murder because we stand on that foundation of the Word of God that says human beings are made in the image of God, the Imago Dei, right? Set apart and unique from all other creatures. Um, the child in the womb is as real and valuable a person as those at any other stage of development. This is a big argument that you hear quite a bit is that oftentimes the only, they start speaking in different languages, especially Latin, once you start talking to the, the um, pro-choice movement and you'll say it's just a fetus. They'll just say, well, the fetus isn't, you know, at a stage of development, and you just have to say, why are you speaking Latin all of a sudden? Fetus is offspring, uh, it's just the word for offspring or small child. So it's changing the narrative when we come in contact with people who are um, hostile to the movement is keeping them consistent as you mean, you mean small child. Uh, when you say fetus, you mean small child. Um, and they, they believe abort, you can't murder a fetus, a fetus, just a clump of cells was another big argument that you heard a lot um, in the 70s and 80s that has now been uh, biologically no, you know, proven to be false, that it's not a clump of cells, that at the moment of conception, that, that's an image bearer of God in the womb. At the moment of conception, the only real difference is size, level of development, and dependency on the mother. And we don't murder children because of their size. We don't murder children because of their level of dependency on the mother. And we don't murder children based on their development. Right? I have a handicap. Uh, I call her my sister. She's not a, a blood sister or anything like that, but I've known her for f since I was little, about Fitz's age, about two and a half years old. Uh, Fitz is my son. He's two and a half. And... She's fully dependent. She's a 54-year-old woman, handicapped, and she has a mind of a three-month-old. She is fully dependent on her caregivers full-time to take care of her. She would, she would die. And so the argument that, well, it's, it's not really the, the child's right in the womb because he's dependent upon the mother, so the mother has the right to murder that child is no different than me going, because my sister Chrissy who's fully dependent on me, who's now, a, you know, it's hard sometimes. It can be, uh, feel like a burden. You can't do certain things, right? Because you can't, you can't just leave a handicapped person uh, to their own or they, they would perish and you'd say, well, can I just murder her? Can I kill her now because she's dependent on me? No, we don't murder people because they're dependent upon us. And we don't murder people because of their level of development, Right. So that's big is when we go there, as we call it, abortion is murder. We try to get that paradigm shift as to know that, hey, um, there's no difference in at conception and you standing here right now, you're as every bit of a person as you are at that moment of conception. And so that's huge. And so it's unjust, you know, to take a life of an image bearer of God. We know that. 
God says abortion is murder. God forbids murder in his law, stating that human beings are so valuable that to take their life unjustly affords a death sentence at the hands of the civil magistrate. So what I say there is what I'm, I'm communicating the law of God of understanding that how seriously God takes life. I'm not standing up here and saying, hey, let's pass legislation that would put a woman to death if she had an abortion. That's something that... Um, is often the misunderstood within uh, ministries like ours to the other pro-life movement. Uh, they go, you just want to execute women. That's, that's crazy. What we're saying is that we want justice because God commands it that, uh, because abortion is murder. So that's number one. Number two is abortion is an issue of sin, plain and simple. Uh, those who hate God love death, Proverbs 8.36. So why are they walking in? What, what's causing that... Uh, mother and father to walk in to murder their child, what causes that? Well, it's sin. Uh, and God hates the, the hands that shed innocent blood. It says in his word, an abortion is sacrifice of children in the womb as a result of the sinfulness of the human heart. It's no different than in the biblical text that we saw when there was uh, child sacrifice in the Old Testament and they were promised, you sacrifice your child to us and you will get riches and comfort and reward. And that's often the message that you hear at the Planned Parenthoods. Give us your child and you can finish college. Give us your child and you, this won't be a financial burden onto us. It's that Jezebel spirit that's moving in this, that child sacrifice that's happening. And the only remedy is repentance within the church and within the country. And I mean by that is that the church needs to repent of their apathy to this issue. It's not just merely saying, okay, yep, I disagree with it. Let's vote pro-life. It's coming out and getting involved and standing on God's word boldly and proclaiming what is really happening. And that's what End Abortion Now strives to do. And that's why we need uh, men and women like you to come out with us. And we'll talk about how you can do that more later on. But number three, uh, it's about the gospel. It's about the gospel. It's not about um, just offering uh, tools and, and things like that. That's part of our message as well. But what's going to change their uh, heart to, from murdering to not murdering somebody? It's the gospel. That's the only thing that changes uh, anyone from moving from sin and into a life of repentance. And abortion is a moral issue. Right? It's a violation of God's holy law. We've said that many, many times. And this testifies to the conscience of the sinner that they have offended the God that they know exists. So there's no neutrality here, like we said before. It's not that they just need more evidences um, and, and more you know, evidence that there's a baby inside. They know exactly what's going on. They know the, the, the one true God, but they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And therefore, the message is to repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ for forgiveness and sins and peace with God. Unfortunately, that's a radical thing. That slide right there in the American church with the American gospel, that's a radical thing to talk about right now. To say, hey, let's go and talk, let's share the gospel. Let's say, use words like repentance and, and Jesus and, you know, it, it's just, that's too abrasive. That's too abrasive. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that the first week I went out there. I was like, hey, you know, I'm glad you're here, but that sign, uh, that's kind of a, you know, that's a little too much. That's a little too much. And then you ask them, well, what, what's offending it? Well, it says you're saying it's murder. Yeah, what is it? Do you not believe it's murder? And they'll say, yeah, it's murder. So why not call it that? Why are we suppressing this? Why are we watering it down for the sake of um, this neutrality? So, um, just understand that we, we're, we're going with abortion is murder, it's an issue of sin, it's about the gospel, and this kind of explains a little bit more of that gospel message. We've thought for so long in terms of neutrality and incrementalism that we've lost sight of what the ultimate goal really is. And I think if you consider this as a Christian, Letting go of our traditions, even pro-life traditions, as, as grateful to God as we are for all of the pro-life victories that have saved children, I think we have to ask the question, can I remove these blinders and these traditions to actually stand on the Word of God and be consistent? What's the message of the Scriptures? Those are image bearers of God. God demands justice. God calls His people to turn from evil, to cease from doing evil, learn to do good, to seek justice, to actually protect the fatherless, to, to hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. The Christian message is to call it what it is, sin. To call people to turn from sin to Christ. 
to plead with the world to come and receive forgiveness and salvation and to demand that the injustice of the murder of children stop once and for all. Right, very clear, right? Very clear. Um, that's why we go down there to communicate that message. And four, this is just as important that we want to help the mothers and fathers considering abortion. I don't want to, um, it often sounds like in ministries like this that, well, you're just there to condemn and to preach and to shout. No, we are there because we don't want to see them murder their child and we want to help them. Literally, we want to help the mothers and fathers considering abortion. And it's the concern of God's people to see to the responsibility and care of the unborn and the voiceless and the least of these. And so what we say to that is that we have, there's, a, there's clinics next door to these most abortion clinics that offer free health care, real health care to the women. Um, that, and they don't provide abortions. And we say, if you're here and you need uh, health care, um, check out this clinic, They'll, everything is free. We offer, because a lot of times they don't understand that there's free help out there. And we say um, that we'll, in, we'll adopt their baby. Uh, my wife and I, if, if, if a woman says you will seriously adopt your child, we will adopt their baby that day, by God's grace, if that happens. If they don't want us to adopt their child or they just want to think about it, uh, we have resources with adoption agencies that they can contact that will immediately get that process started for them and that they can help with that financial um, burden that unfortunately adoption carries. That's something that is extremely sad that it's, it's cheaper to kill your child in this country than it is to adopt a baby. That's just, that, that needs to change. Um, and so we'll provide them with anything they need. That includes adoption, care of their physical needs, and help them uh, with locating pregnancy services. And so um, a little bit about kind of an example. This next slide, it, it's cool. This is kind of a real life example of, of what, um, not exactly how we, how we say it, but this is very close to kind of what we communicate while we're down there. My name is John. I come down here every day to offer hope and help to the ladies that find themselves behind these doors. All these people have come here today, not by chance. God has sent us all here today to help you. Honestly, I've been able to see over 2,000 girls choose life over the last nine years. That's not counting the turnaways that didn't talk to us. And God has never let one of them down, not one. About helping you out. This place, this is, a, this is the worst abortion clinic in the country. This is a real doctor's office with real lady doctors, real lady nurses. Everything's free. If she is pregnant, they'll give her a free ultrasound. They get her free medical help, get her financial help. And I'll give you my business card. My church will help you guys with whatever else it is that you need. Yeah, please, I appreciate that. But, uh, yeah, this place, man. Right, let her get in here before she gets to the Yeah, get her out of here. Get her out of here. Appreciate you guys. Well, appreciate you, sir. I don't see men here very often. Oh, man, no way. They're leaving. I'm serious. When I tell you that we can help you, that our church can help you, with with all the things that you could need. I don't want you to think you're alone. You're not alone. I've never seen God let anybody down that put their trust in Him and got out of here. Can I pray for you? Yeah. What's your name? Dear Lord Jesus, I lift up to you. Lord, I thank you that today we get to see a man. It's so rare. And Lord, I just ask that you would be with him, that you would strengthen his resolve that you would help him to be the kind of lady or hu husband that his lady needs. And Lord, I just ask that you would continue to put your hand of blessing on their life and that they would not be proud and that they would call, call me for anything they need. In Jesus' name, amen. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I, wanna, I hope we end up being long friends. Honestly, you too. What happened? They're out of here. Cool stuff, right? Just a simple uh, act of going down there and, and 
preaching to these ladies and fathers of just letting them know what's going on. It's as simple as that. And so um, how can you help us? We need you to help us. We want to um, partner with you to mobi help mobilize you to come out with us uh, to take action. And want you to know that you can do this if you just have a few hours, a few moments uh, during the month and the, and the weeks. And you are needed to speak up for your pre-born neighbors. Remember, those uh, boys and girls in the womb there, those are your neighbors. And we're to love our neighbor. Right? And so we want to speak up for the unborn there. United, we are a powerful force under Christ, bringing the evil of abortion underneath uh, Jesus' feet, using his message by the power of his spirit. Just like you saw, these are average, these are just regular men and women that are going out faithfully um, and being told a lot, like you saw, by the, the, the higher uh, pro-life movement there, that that's just too abrasive. What's so abrasive about saying, don't murder your child, let us help you, and you see what happens from that. Right, um, So we want you to take action with us, and we would love to do that with you. And so um, how can you do that? How can you do that? I say saving babies is as easy as one, two, three. Uh, and you can join an abortion clinic ministry uh, like ours with Defend Truth Ministries. We're a local uh, and abortion now partner here in the Twin Cities, so we can use uh, every, every resource, every sign that you see up here um, is one of their signs that they sent for me. Some you have to purchase more if you want more, but they give you all of this for free and, and we get free training. And you can see there's my uh, sweet baby right there who's in the back, Fitzgerald, who just sneezed. Bless you, buddy. Um, he, he comes out, he came out with this one time and he He's holding a sign there, just says choose life. Right? Choose life. And so it's especially when it's warm out in the in the summertime, bringing the kids out if you feel um, that you're you're okay to do that. It's a great testimony. It's a great testimony. And I, I don't want to sound abrasive much longer, but even him holding a sign like that, the pro-life movement says, hey, take that sign and bring it, you know, not don't go by the corner like that. Go bring it down the street a little bit. We don't want the signs, we don't want the win. It's too abrasive. Even a, a two-year-old holding a sign that says choose life offends that pro-life movement. And it's just, it's just sad because they, um, we could really, you know, come together with this and, um, make a difference. So it's real simple. Uh, literally, it's real simple. Uh, Jess, who's our, who's our amazing writer in this ministry with Defend Truth, he sends out a newsletter every month to communicate to uh, men and women in the Twin Cities when we're going out and when we're going to be showing up, where we're going to be showing up. And so all you have to do is reply and say, yeah, I'll, I'll join you. And you'll watch the, the free resources that we have to make sure you kind of equip you a little bit to what's going on. And it's as easy as one, two, three. You sign up, you show up, and you smile and wave using our end abortion now resources. This was a big uh, hurdle for me as a, as a believer of the signs, right? We have signs here, and I'm like, I am now a Christian that's holding a sign. I never thought I would be a Christian holding a sign. And, um, and I want to make it very clear, we are not the Westboro Baptist sign holders, okay? That's unfortunately, they have kind of hijacked, you know, what signs in Christianity represent. The signs here are strictly, um, we have a strict rule with End Abortion Now um, and Defend Truth Ministries is that, uh, well, that they require of us when we partner with them, they make sure they say you're not to break the law at any time and disrupt and be uh, disruptors at any time, um, but to hold our sign and we want you to smile and wave. Just smile and wave, that goes a long way because unfortunately the apologetic, the defense that a lot of the people that are driving by have against us is um, the middle finger. So you'll get a lot of middle fingers and when you have a two year old like my son, the cutest baby in the world, smiling back at him, it's kind of, they kind of feel, you know, shamed a little bit of like, wow, I just flipped off a two year old. Um, <laughs> So it, it goes a long way to uh, just share that message of choosing life and understanding that, hey, we're all here for the same purpose. Um, and you can, you get, we have a variety of signs here, so you can pick which one that you want to hold if you don't feel led to communicate the gospel or anything like that. Um, you just show up, pick a sign, and, and take your spot on the corner there and just smile and wave, and you are saving babies doing that. I want you to know that if you're, um, you don't have to be Nick or I um, on the corner uh, sharing the gospel with the women to be somehow um, important or anything like that. It, you're, you're just as important coming out, holding a sign, showing up. Uh, then it, there's no super Christian here in Defend Truth Ministries. We're all under the blood of Jesus, and by um, putting our faith in him, we're all equally saved. So we want to just communicate that you just show up, you grab a sign, you smile and wave, or if you want to um, kind of counsel the women, the, the women that leave, um, 
That's another opportunity for the women that get involved in this ministry. That goes a long way. Uh, with my wife, Courtney, and uh, we have a dear friend, April, who were there one time, and Jamie, they were there. It was really cool to see um, the women that were walking out. They would kind of swoop in and just and just care for these women. You can just see them counseling them and, and bringing them over to that other clinic, and that goes a long way. So we need uh, men and women to come and join us in this, in this fight to end abortion. Number two, um, engage your local legislatures. Um, a lot of times we think that it's, uh, in this country, voting for the president is enough. And that's going to change things, and Supreme Court justices, this big federal machine it's, you're, it's really hard to change. Um, what you can change is at the local legislature, though, in your own city council, with your own um, city council members, and going to the legislature. This is something that we're going to try to do, hopefully over the winter, at the next um, city council meeting in Burnsville, where I live, is to, is to do this. And then anywhere that you live, look into when they're going to have local city council meetings and share the gospel with them. And, and this next slide will kind of demonstrate what that looks like, how you can get involved at the local level to really fight uh, abortion in this country. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Reverend Zach Morgan, and I'm with Apologia Church. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Our God commands us not to murder. Killing of an innocent baby in the womb is murder in the eyes of God. So the powerful thing about how Pastor Zach Morgan went and approached the legislature was that it wasn't so much about expecting that at that moment the legislature was going to say, oh yes, we see, we're going to immediately criminalize abortion. This is a mustard seed being planted and it's more about the gospel being proclaimed in the public square and to the authorities than it is about expecting that at this very moment we're gonna have an end to abortion. That's not how the gospel works. You all play a very crucial role in the governance of our city and presently have a delegated position of authority by God. You must wake up, you must come to your senses, you must act on behalf of the most oppressed people group on this earth. Your primary duty is to protect our city's inhabitants. Look what God commands you in his word. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling towards the slaughter. That's our duty. We have to act according to this most important priority now. So Pastor Zach Morgan went to the Phoenix City Council to preach the gospel. That led to a long string of Christian churches and ministers of the gospel, pastors across the United States of America going and doing the same thing. Well, my name is Marcus Pittman. I am a member of Apologia Church. My name is Michael Hendrickson. Hi, my name is Mikey. I strive to love Jesus each and every day. My name is Harold King. My name is Crystal Marshall. My name is Taryn Conover. My name is Reese Morgan. My name is Sarah Cleveland. Make the city of Phoenix a sanctuary city for pre-born children. Norman resident Shane Dodson addressing city council urging them to stand against abortion. You got to start somewhere and we're starting locally. As he spoke, two council members, Kate Bierman and Alex Scott, turned their chairs around. Council member Scott, who actually represents Dodson's ward, says his words were hateful towards women. I'm here tonight to talk to you about the atrocity that has been occurring in Hagerstown for many years, currently at 160 West Washington Street. That atrocity, as you may well know, is abortion, okay. the murder of unborn humans. Mr. Mayor, I move we adjourn. Under Robert Scholl, is that a precedent motion? Is it is. Is there any other motions? I need to get a second. Second. All right, so you saw there, uh, little Davey, I think his name was, or Mikey, he was, you know, talking to his legislators. It's that simple. Uh, that's another way that you can... Um, you know, fight this, uh, this fight of ending abortion. So that's uh, Defend Truth Ministries in a nutshell, what we've done with uh, partnering with End Abortion Now. That's our message. That's the, the message that we take to the abortion mills. And we're going to wrap it up now, So uh, and we'll open it up for questioning, okay? All right. So anybody have any questions uh, regarding what we talked about? Feel free to just shout out anything you'd like, and we can go from there. Or sit in awkward silence. <laughs> was right to life formerly a Christian ministry? What's that? Was right to life formerly a Christian ministry? I think at one point um, it was, and 
I think that's what it started out to strive to be. But once it becomes, when you lose that foundation, like we talked about, and you give up the foundation to other groups like that, then it slowly gets quenched out, like you've seen. So yeah, great question. They, they start out as a Christian minister, you know, a Christian group, if you will, but then when other people start coming in saying, hey, don't, don't preach the gospel, don't use that language, eventually it just they have to appease, like Pastor Zach said there, they have to appease all these different worldviews to where it doesn't become Christian at all um, because of that. Um, and another thing that was interesting that we didn't show in here, but these legislation bills that we think are really powerful and are really amazing bills, the heartbeat bill is something that it is, like we said, um, and we continue to communicate that we're not here to spread animosity against the pro-life groups. Uh, they're not our enemy. We're just saying look at the compromise and look at the bureaucratic system that is really not fixing abortion in this country. It's not ending it. And we look at heartbeat bills like, you know, they have to see the heartbeat. They, they have to see their ultrasound. And we think, well, that's going to that's gonna change everything. But then what they communicated in this, in this video was, um, well, you're trusting the murderer, the abortionist, to show them the ultrasound, right? And they, what we saw in this video was that they can, they, can, um, they can change that. They can manipulate the ultrasound to say, I fulfilled that law of showing you the ultrasound, but not ever showing you the baby one time. So we're trusting murderers uh, to tell the truth when they're in that clinic. So that's why we, we, we cheer when we see legislation happen, but we, it's, I've heard, and this was what shocked me, was, hey, we know that babies are still being murdered, but it, we gotta start somewhere, is kind of what you hear a lot, and it's like, no, we need to end this. You wouldn't talk that way to slavery and things like that in our country. So, um, yeah, anything else regarding kind of what we do? Yeah, Joe. Uh, good question. So the big thing is we just um, would like to see more men and women come out with us. Uh, we want to get engaged in the local legislatures. So like what you saw at the very end there with people showing up to the legislatures, we want to show up to our own legislatures, uh, film them so we can um, you know, show what's going on, to use media number one, as a major platform. A lot of times in Christian circles, we, we view social media and the media as our enemy, but guess what this allows us to do? We can bring the gospel to an abortion clinic and within hours, it can be seen around the world now. And, and uh, that sermon that I saw, if we didn't have the internet, I wouldn't have seen that sermon that sparked that you know, desire in my own heart to go out and motivate. And so a lot of it is just building up this uh, platform, uh, using our social media platform, um, and getting out there with other men and women. Coming with us is a big deal. So we would just would like to see more uh, faithful men and women join us as much as possible over the next six months and kind of just see, not so we can get massive in numbers, but just so we can see the local church, um, you know, get, get involved more. So, yeah. Anything else? Just So, one thing I'd just like you to touch on a little bit more, it's not like all of the pro-life people that we run right. are against us. Right. So if you want to talk yeah. about that. Yep, good, uh, good point. So, We've met some really awesome pro-life um, individuals that are down there that are in like a pro-life organization uh, specifically who see what we're doing and go, hey, this is really cool. And they're not, it's not always like, you know, animosity with us. Um, we also have seen a lot of the opposite where you show up and you can just tell they do not want us to be there. And we're not... Uh, street screechers in any way and we're not jerks for Jesus so we don't go there to just you know scream at people and disrupt everything um, and so yeah the pro we want to what we're doing with the pro-life individuals down there is kind of just sharing little facts that a lot of them don't know right and to kind of get them thinking a little differently like hey you're here with this organization that had a chance to end abortion but didn't do it how do you feel about that 
and this is kind of why we're here and why we share the gospel. Maybe how come you don't share the gospel and just have conversations with them. And um, yeah, we've had amazing, like we're, there's a couple people that will probably hopefully join us that were once part of those pro-life movements and say, hey, I really like what you're doing. Can I help you out? And you'll see, you know, um, other people with our signs. We don't, People can hold their signs, who's ever there. We'll have them left out, and all of a sudden you'll see, uh, you know, people from different groups all of a sudden taking our signs, and we're not going to stop them from doing that. So it's not like this exclusive uh, group down there. But we're just trying to raise awareness, be that, uh, that bring reformation, if you will, even into the pro-life movement, too. So, yeah, anything else? I had a quick question yeah. regarding, like, adoptions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lord willing, if you have, like, an overflow of people actually needing adoptions, like, yeah. what do you handle? Might have a couple of couples there that could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, which just say like you had like five or six people say yes, we need a doctor yeah. in one day. Yeah, that would be that'd be it. Incredible. Be, uh, um, that'd be awesome. And so what we always say is first know when you're coming down there, know your like whatever local church you're part of. First, know what resources do they have re- pertaining to adoption. Get involved with that and understand um, that. When you're coming down there, we have there's like Bethany um, or Bethel adoption centers. There's uh, two other that two others that we can work with here. Is sending them over to these other abortion um, resources, and they contact them within. It's like really fast because I talked to some of them, and I'm like, what happens hypothetically if someone says we want to adopt? You're like you'll actually do it, and they said you give them their contact information. You can even drive them over here, and then we will hold their hand every step of the way. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen, other than that one yeah. woman, you know, kind of, you know, if we see five people say, yeah, I'll adopt your child, I mean, that's, your t- that is huge. The mighty, yeah. Mighty yep. Really yep. Now. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. It is. And like, we're praying for that every time we show up and like, hey, if that happened, that'd be a great problem to have. Yeah. If you, you know, and, and, yeah. Right. Huh. Yeah. Otherwise, he'd rather kill the child than yeah. have someone else raise it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Something that would be that would be an amazing problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, I just reiterate one more time: it's we're not here to uh, bash the pro-life movement. We're not anti-pro-life. I know it. Um, we're just raising. I, I just look at that and go, okay, I can't. You know, I don't want to be a part of. If this is what it means to be pro-life, that's not ending abortion. And so let's reform it. It's okay to reform things. And uh, Defend Truth is all about bringing reformation to uh, the world that we live in and being called to go out and do it. So, um, yeah, anything else? All right. Oh, yes, ma'am. That is a great question, and to kind of feed on your question there, that's something that we're going to strive to do. So this is our first, like, um, test run to this, like, seminar, if you will, and we would love to get in to, we're going to start communicating to other churches and saying, hey, this is who we are, this is what we do, can we come in and educate your church, Um, and there's ways, because we would love to see other churches partner with and abortion now, and, and just bring that. So yeah, we want to take, um, Defend Truth wants to take this message into other churches, kind of rally them, get them fired up, show them these resources, and that's going to be on you know the hearts of their local pastors and things like that. So it's all about getting this message out, sharing it, and then saying, hey, go to your local church and ask them, hey, what do you guys have for this? Can we bring this in? And so we would love to see a double in like how many churches in the Twin Cities partner with End Abortion Now in the next six months, too. That would be a huge, uh, by God's grace, that'd be a great goal to reach there. Um, yeah, anything else? All right. No one has anything else. I wanted yeah. to share yeah. one thing. Really yeah, come quick, on up. And then, mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to, okay, perfect. I'll just stand right yeah. there. It's just, it's just very quick. I just have a, uh, hey, oh yeah, uh, my name is Nick. <laughs> Nick, Nick Matei. I'm the co-founder of Defend Truth with Nate. And I just wanted to share this quick quote from uh, the book, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, the, uh, age of the ch- uh, part one, the age of the early church fathers. And I was reading this the other night for an assignment, and I felt that it really played into what we're doing here. And I just want to read this quote about what the early church faced in the pagan society of Rome they lived in. Uh, the moral and social values of the early Christians brought them into sharp conflict with the pagan society in which they lived. In part, this was because of the way that the pagan religion was present in so many of the empire's social practices and institutions. And to be honest, we're not really in that much of a different situation. We as Christians are kind of living in that type of 
uh, debauchery of the uh, late Roman Empire, uh, the love of death, the sexual perversion, and the lawlessness that's abounding. And they, the Christians, our brothers and sisters of 2,000 years ago, had a certain reaction in a way that they lived. There were other aspects of Roman society that Christians opposed on ethical grounds. For example, Christians condemned the most popular form of Roman entertainment, the gladiator arena, where men fought each other to the death. The church rejected such violence and the enjoyment of watching it as utterly contrary to Christ who came to give life and not destroy it. Christians also rejected the widespread Roman custom of abortion, killing unwanted unborn children and infanticide, killing unwanted newly born children. And this was the church 2,000 years ago, the early church in ancient pagan Rome, universally rejected abortion and they stood strong on it and they received a lot of opposition and they would go and try and adopt children or they would there was something that the Romans used to do called exposing children where if someone didn't want a child whether they would abort it or not they would leave it out on the road and the Christians would come and take the children and raise them and so this is a call to the church now and to everyone here that let us take the example of our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago that were standing and sacrificing time and energy in their lives to stand for the unborn. Let us not be, you know, let's not be cowards, basically is what I'm saying. We, we need to continue this in this age just as they did 2,000 years ago. So that's, that's what I wanted to share, uh, just finishing up here. So thank you all for coming. Appreciate you guys being here, and God bless you all. So yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.